Good morning, everybody. We're live here from the birdhouse. It is August 19th, so we are in the middle of the month. And today we're talking about the monarch butterfly, which you might have in your gardens, especially if you have blooming flowers or milkweed. We've been raising some monarch butterflies here at the store. We've been raising some caterpillars, I guess I should say. And they have all gone into their J stage, which I'll show you what that is as we go on. If you're not sure what that is um and uh so not only that but we have some that are in their chrysalis and some that have even hatched out of their chrysalis that we've let go and out into the world so um there's definitely lots of monarch butterflies out there there's still caterpillars so you could still find eggs on the underside of those milkweed leaves so check your garden if you do have some milkweed out there you might just have some monarch butterfly caterpillars or eggs still. Um, as always, we love to know what kind of things you're seeing. You can put those in the comments. If you have any questions, you can put those in there too. And, um, uh, and we will get started here. So, um, so as far as things that people are seeing um, in the area. There we go. Um, lots of goldfinches. We've been getting reports of baby goldfinches out there. So goldfinches nest super late in the season and it seems like their babies are starting to go out in the world. So if you see some kind of disheveled looking little finches at your Niger feeder, probably baby goldfinches. So we're just starting to get some reports on them. And um, Orioles, some people still have Orioles and even more hummingbirds than Orioles at this time. So a little bit of a mix of everything right now. But today we're talking about monarch butterflies. And monarch butterflies, just like other insects, go through a metamorphosis. They start off as an egg, that egg hatches and out comes the larva or the caterpillar. That larva will pupate and form a chrysalis and out of that chrysalis hatches the adult. So in general, when you're thinking about butterflies and if you want a garden for butterflies, uh, you want to have plants for each stage. So monarch butterflies are pretty unique in regards to what they need because they rely totally on milkweed. So you can just plant milkweeds and that is everything that the monarchs need to survive. So um, <clears throat> they're pretty unique like that other species are different where they're what they are considered their host plants where the adults will lay their eggs are usually different than the plants that they will drink nectar from but uh, we talk about that when we're talking about butterfly gardening in general we go through some of those different plants but today we're talking about the monarch in general though when you're talking about butterflies and butterflies and moths um, there are ways to tell the difference between the two and I'll show you those. What's really neat about butterflies and moths is that their caterpillar stage or their larval stage is so so different than their adult stage. So in the bottom left corner you can see your typical kind of caterpillar. They have a mouth that is made just to chew and eat all day long basically. They will chew and eat different types of leaves and then um, once they have become a butterfly, that changes into a straw-like tube called a proboscis that they use to dip into plants to, uh, to grab the nectar. And butterflies and moths are in an insect order called Lepidoptera, which translates to scaled wing. And if you were to look at a wing of a moth or a butterfly underneath a a scope like a microscope you would see that it is in fact covered by tiny little scales and that's what gives them their color so here's a picture it looks like of a tiger swallowtail wing close up so if you've ever happened to touch a butterfly or moth um, perchance or sometimes if they land somewhere you might see that there's a powdery substance that's left behind those are those little scales on their wings that are giving them color um, and there are ways to tell butterflies and moths apart if you're trying to. Not all butterflies are showy. Some of them, like this cabbage white butterfly in the top left, are kind of plain and you can find them pretty often in your backyards. And not all moths are, are plain. Some of them are really, really showy. So it's not the coloration so much that will dictate what is a butterfly and what is a moth, um, but it's some of their physical characteristics. For example, 
Butterflies have antenna with some kind of a little projection at the end, either a little ball or something that gets larger at the end of the antenna, whereas moths have just very straight antenna, nothing that comes out at the end, or they look like feathers. And most butterflies, in fact, all butterflies that we have here, at least in New York, are diurnal, meaning that they are active during the day. Most moths are nocturnal, but that's not always the case. We do have some day flying moths that are around here. The hummingbird clearwing moth is a really good example of that that you might see in your garden. If you see something that looks kind of like a hummingbird, but a little bit off, take a look. It might be a hummingbird clearwing moth. When at rest, butterflies will hold their wings upright over their body, like this picture shows here of the monarch butterfly. And moths tend to spread their wings out, like this picture of a luna moth here. And butterflies will form a chrysalis, and the moths will form a cocoon, which has kind of a webbing over it. So here's just some kind of close-up pictures showing some of those differences where the butterfly here on the top left has that little projection on the end of its antenna where it gets bigger. And then the moth antenna either looks like feathers, which are pretty cool, like on the giant silk moths have these crazy looking antenna that look like feathers, or they're just completely straight, like this sod moth here. And then butterflies will form their hardened shell of a chrysalis, like this swallowtail here. That looks like it just emerged. And then the moths will form a cocoon. So if you were to, to look in this cocoon and open it up, inside there would be a hard shell of a pupa inside. But those are some of the differences between butterflies and moths. But today we're talking about the monarch butterfly, which is in a family called Nymphalidae, which means brush-footed butterflies. And they all have a reduced pair of forelegs. So if you're looking at the monarch when it is perched on something, when it's landed on a flower or on a plant, it actually looks like they only have four legs total because the two front legs are really tucked into their body and you rarely see them move those. So here's a picture in the, the bottom picture here and it shows where you, those, those legs where it looks like they only have two sets of legs, but they actually do have like all other insects, um, three pairs of legs, just those first pair are reduced. They are bright, bright orange. They're one of the largest and showiest butterflies we have in the area. And you can find them all over the place. You can find them in any kind of open habitat, especially if there are milkweed plants around. You can tell the difference between male and female as well. So the males have scent pouches on their wings that emit pheromones. And that's what these little black dots are here on the male butterfly. So the male butterfly is on the left and on their hind wing, they have these little dots that you can see both when their wings are open and when they're at rest over their body. So that's the male. The male also has thinner veins on its wings, which kind of can be hard to tell the difference um, unless you have a male and female right next to each other. But the males have thinner veins on their wings and then the female over here does not have those scent pouches and they have larger, thicker veins on their wings. As far as their life cycle goes, it starts off as an egg, and this is the typical posture of a butterfly laying its eggs. They'll curve, uh, cur curve their body underneath the, uh, the leaf of the milkweed plant in order to lay their egg on the underside of the leaf, and uh, that's what this butterfly is doing here. And then if you look below, there is a zoomed in section of what's actually happening. And you can see that little egg is coming out of the adult butterfly. And one female monarch alone will lay about 500 eggs. And they tend to, to lay just one egg per plant. Uh, but out of those 500 eggs that are laid, only about one in 20 will make it to adulthood. So it can be pretty rough out there for those young caterpillars. The eggs need to be laid on milkweed and those eggs will stay on that milkweed plant for about three or four days and that's when they hatch. And this is the picture of the egg. It has little ridges on it. And right before it's about to hatch, you can tell because you can start to see the head of the caterpillar in it. It starts to get kind of a little dark, so you can see that it's about to hatch. And once they hatch, they are very, very 
small and the first thing that they start to do is eat and they will continue to do that and they'll even eat the shell of the egg that they just hatched out of so they just constantly eat and eat and eat the caterpillar stage in general with the monarchs will last 10 to 14 days and it is temperature dependent so if you're raising uh, monarch caterpillars indoors where you might have uh, like air conditioning and it's cooler it'll take longer but if you're raising them outside or if they're just outside on their own it usually goes faster so the colder they are the longer this cycle takes they have what are called five larval instars so as they they eat and eat and grow they have to shed their skin so they'll shed their skin a few times to get to these five different instars and in the bottom right corner here you can kind of see how they get larger and larger each time the first instar is in the very very bottom of the picture here the very bottom left so they're really really small at first and then they get quite quite large every time they shed their skin this is what their uh, sh the skin shed looks like here on this picture on the left you can see that there so they shed their skin and just like how they eat that shell of the egg they'll also eat that shed skin as they continue to grow and eat so as far as the caterpillar stage goes, they'll be eating for about a couple of weeks and then they form what's called the J stage or they enter the J stage, I guess I should say. And this is what we've got the last of our caterpillars here at the store as of this morning are all in their J stage where they hang upside down by some silk that they create and they look like a little J and uh, they will hang there for Usually it could be a few hours, it could be a day, and then they will form their chrysalis. And usually they form their chrysalis in the morning, and that chrysalis stage can last for 10 to 14 days. So again, about another two weeks that they're inside that chrysalis, and then out will hatch the butterfly. And I do have a time-lapse video here that I found uh, showing this formation of the chrysalis, which is pretty... Oh, pretty neat and it doesn't take it's this is sped up but it doesn't take that much time So that is the process of them forming their chrysalis. So if you're lucky enough to see it, you know that it doesn't take that much time at all. It can be just a few minutes, can be you know closer to 10 minutes, but it doesn't take very long at all for them to go from that caterpillar into their chrysalis form. So if you blink, you can miss it, it seems. Uh, but it does tend to happen in the morning is when they tend to, to do it. So if you have caterpillars that are in their J stage that you're seeing, keep an eye on them in the morning. So the, uh, the 
the insect is in that chrysalis for about two weeks and just like the egg how you can start to see the egg getting dark before something emerges from it same with the chrysalis so it goes from green it's a really pretty green with the gold kind of highlights on it it'll start to get darker in color and you'll start to be able to see the wing pattern of the monarchs inside that chrysalis and then uh, they will hatch out they come out with their wings all crumpled up um, and then as they start to pump blood through their body as they start to pump that through and into the veins of their wings those wings will will expand and after a couple of hours uh, sometimes a few hours those wings will harden and they'll be able to fly so if you are raising them in your house you don't want to put them outside right away you do want to let them kind of hang they'll just hang up on the outside of their chrysalis for a while and uh, you want to wait a few hours so their wings are, are are dry so they're able to fly before letting them out as far as um, monarchs go they are toxic so milkweed plants are toxic to most vertebrates so inside the milkweed leaves there are um, chemicals that are uh, toxic to mammals and the caterpillars as they're eating those milkweed leaves they also become toxic because they are ingesting them and they have what's called aposomatic or a warning coloration to warn predators that they are toxic now that being said they still do have some predators like spiders are a good example and i'll show you some of their other predators too as we go on as far as the coloration goes, there are mimics of monarch butterflies that look super similar. This is called the Viceroy butterfly. And uh, if you were to just take a quick glance, you would probably think that this is a monarch butterfly. But the Viceroy is a little bit smaller in size. So it's about, it's in between, I would say, the, the size of the, the monarch butterfly and say the cabbage white butterfly. So it's a little bit larger than the cabbage white butterfly, but still smaller than your typical monarch. And then they also have this line that goes through their hind wing here. And you can see it when their wings are open and then also when their wings are at rest. So that's how you can tell that you've got yourself a viceroy butterfly and not a monarch butterfly. Predators. There are different predators, uh, spiders being one, assassin bugs, which is this kind of gnarly looking thing here on the, the top of the screen. This is called a wheel bug, which is a type of assassin bug. And like their name suggests, they will eat other things like the caterpillars or the, the monarch butterflies themselves. There's different flies that will parasitize the caterpillars, they'll lay their eggs inside the caterpillars, just like wasps will do that as well. And then other monarch caterpillars, if you have a large monarch caterpillar, really large, maybe in the fourth or fifth instar that's really chowing away on um, leaves, um, that might eat a smaller caterpillar or an egg that's on the leaf. So other monarch caterpillars are sometimes predators of monarchs as well. There are some mammal predators, so they're not toxic to every single mammal, but they are toxic to most mammals. But there are some, uh, there are some mammals and some uh, bird predators that the monarchs have, like this black-eared mouse and the black-backed oriole and the black-headed grosbeak. And these animals are found down in Mexico where the monarchs will spend the winter. So that's where you can find these predators. And the monarchs are migratory, which is really amazing. And they start off their migration down in Mexico. And what happens is come spring, usually around March, they start their migration northward. And as they're going north, those females will start to lay eggs on milkweed. Those eggs will hatch. You've got the whole process of going from egg to caterpillar to adult, and then those adults will continue the migration northward. So there's actually a few generations that will travel north. So that first generation that's down in Mexico that starts the migration northward, we'll never see those here um, in upstate New York, but we'll see about the third or fourth generations as they go. So the 
the monarchs have a few generations removed from when they're going north back down to south, which is pretty amazing. So it's that what's called the fourth generation, which is the migratory population, which we'll start to see now. Um, they have kind of stronger, thicker wings, so they're able to make the migration all the way down south to Mexico, which can be over 3,000 miles of a journey, depending on how far north they've gone. And some of this migration has already started. So the monarchs that are way up north in uh, their northernmost uh, areas, they've already started their migration downward. So this migration will come through the area with the peak being around the 3rd to 15th where we are here, where I am, um, which is in western New York in um, Rochester upstate area. So um, our peak migration is still about a month away, a little bit less. And that's when you can see huge groups of monarchs sometimes passing through. Um, and the adults can fly anywhere between 50 and 100 miles a day. So they can travel a pretty big distance depending on the conditions that they have. You can also tag monarchs, that is possible. Tags can be purchased online on a website called Monarch Watch, which is a really, really good resource if you're interested in monarch butterflies. They're constantly giving updates about populations and migration. And the tags ship to you when the fourth generation has hatched in your area. And the tags aren't very expensive. And what they are are just little tiny stickers. And these stickers can go on a very special part of the monarch's wing called the discal cell. And it's this little uh, cell of the wing here that almost looks like a mitten. If you put the sticker there, it's found that it really doesn't impede the butterfly's flight. So the sticker can go there. And each sticker has six characters on it. So it's a mix of letters and numbers. So each one is unique. So when you're tagging the monarchs, you get a sheet where you can put your tag code, so whatever those six, um, those six digits are. You can put in there the location that you found the monarch or that you tagged the monarch. You put if it's male or female, and you put on there if you happen to capture it out in nature if you were out there with a net and captured it or if you raised it yourself and then let it go so the, uh, the monarchs can get tagged and then they are uh, they're recovered down in their uh, overwintering sites so their winter habitat is down in mexico in a very specific type of what's called the microclimate it is an oil mill fir tree forest is where they spend their winter and a lot of them congregate all in the same area so that can cause um, that can be a, a reason that their populations decline if anything happens to this small little microclimate or if there's a year with bad weather in this in this spot where they're spending the winter it can have a huge impact on their populations and they're st they stay in these forests that have an elevation that's nearly two miles above sea level. So uh, this is a tree, if you can see here, not only is this tree, but the trees behind it are completely covered in monarch butterflies. So that's not the bark um, that's making the tree orange, but it is just thousands and thousands of butterflies that are on these trees. And there can be tens of thousands of butterflies just on one tree alone. But down here in this spot in Mexico, millions and millions of monarchs will congregate. And this is where tags are collected and recorded. So with that data, they can uh, look up the tag number and they can see the data that was submitted of where the butterfly was found and if it was raised in captivity or if it was um, just found out in the wild. And monarch populations are on the decline. Here on the, the East Coast, we have the, the migratory population, which is on the decline. And that ebbs and flows, but you can see as this chart shows that the occupied forest, the amount of occupied forest of monarchs has been steadily decreasing, but ebbing and flowing here and there, uh, but with a steady decline over time. So their populations are going down. And in fact, the monarch butterfly, at least the migratory monarch butterfly that we have, is now considered an endangered species due to habitat loss and climate change. But you can help monarch butterflies by creating what's called the butterfly beltway. Uh, you can create just a little habitat for them 
to lay their eggs and to give them a spot to survive, even in your own garden. They're dependent on milkweed for survival, which I've said, which is super easy to grow. There's several different varieties that you can plant in your garden with three being really common and easy to find in the area. And um, the female butterflies will know that it's milkweed. They'll be able to find these milkweed plants by what are called chemoreceptors that are on their legs and on their abdomen too. So they can land on these plants and they kind of taste them with their legs and they know that they have the right plant that they're on. You want to not only plant your milkweed plants, but you can plant other nectar producing plants for monarchs too. The adults will drink from those and you might get other butterflies too. So you want to make sure that you do plant things for each stage of their life cycle, like uh, milkweed for the monarchs. That's really all they need. Um, and then you want to avoid pesticides. If you are trying to get a mix of different butterflies, adding brush piles can help because some butterflies, not the monarch, but some will spend the winter in their adult form or even if they're in their chrysalis, brush piles are really good for them to kind of crawl into. You can supply water with a little um, bird bath that has soil in it or rocks or sand and that creates what's called a butterfly puddler and they'll sometimes siphon off those nutrients from the sand and soil and um, colors matter so different colored plants attract butterflies so certain colors attract them better than other colors purple and yellow seem to be the preferred colored uh, colors for butterflies but then they will also come to white blue and red flowers as well. As far as milkweeds go, probably the the uh, plant you're most likely to see monarch caterpillars on is this common milkweed, which is found all over the place. You can find it in fields. You might just have it in your garden just growing on its own. It has such big, big leaves that it gives the caterpillars a lot of food. So this is this tends to be the plant where I find most caterpillars and most eggs. And this isn't one you can really find commercially a lot of the time because it does spread a lot in gardens. So not everybody wants it really in their garden, but it's super easy to get if you do want it in your garden but, uh, by just collecting the seeds. So as we go on in the season, right now the seed pods on the, the milkweeds are pretty green, but as you go on, in the season and into the fall, they'll start to turn gray and split open. And there's just a ton of egg or a ton of seeds inside of here. So you can grab those seeds and you can plant them in your garden if you're looking for milkweed. They do have to go through what's called cold striation. So you want to make sure to either um, plant them um, in the fall so they do get a zap of cold in the winter, or you can store them in your refrigerator or your freezer for a bit to give them that uh, what they need in order to germinate. There's also what's called swamp milkweed and swamp milkweed you can find at garden centers a lot of the time especially if they have a native plant section look for swamp milkweed. It doesn't spread like the common milkweed does. It doesn't spread as wildly uh, but it's really pretty uh, it has these pinkish purplish blooms and it blooms for a long time actually in the summer mine's still in bloom right now so this is swamp milkweed and then there's also butterfly weed which is orange and you can also find this in garden centers a lot of the times and both the swamp milkweed and the butterfly weed they both have seed pods like the cotton milkweed does the butterfly weed has these seed pods that stick straight up in the air and again easy to to grow and, and find yourself if you want to just grab those seed pods as the season goes on you can easily find them and um, you can grow them on your own there's so many different nectar producing plants you can get as well for adults things like joe pie weed which is on the left here purple cone flower is easy to find um, butterfly bush those are all things that you can get for the the adults so lots of nectar producing plants anything nectar producing is great for those adult monarchs there are invasives that you should be on the lookout for too especially this one called black swallowwort which is 
all over the place. I find it just popping up in my, my garden here and there. And uh, it, it is closely related to the milkweed plants. So the monarchs will sometimes lay their eggs on this, but it provides no nutrients for the caterpillars. So the caterpillars will eat these leaves and because there's no nutrients in them, they can't survive on these plants. So uh, black swallowwort is big invasive. It has those little seed pods on it like the milkweed does and it's kind of a vine it grows up straight and then kind of flops over and it will tangle in itself and tangle over other plants so it can really take over really really quickly you can find it in the shade you can find it in full sun so be on the lookout for black swallowwort in your garden too so that's everything i have prepared for you guys today about monarch butterflies if you have any questions you can throw those in the comments or if you want to just say hi you can say vote that too or if you've got any sightings we always love to know what kind of things people are seeing so you can put those in the comments also um, we do have some people on here so steel monkey says i have plenty of hummingbirds around now little green ones and they're not afraid they fly right up close but i noticed some of my blue jays are going bald what's up with that? It's creeping me out. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't blame you. It can look kind of weird. Yeah. The um, blue jays and then also sometimes cardinals will molt all the feathers in their head all at once this time of the year. It looks really, really strange, uh, but it's not super uncommon. We tend to get one, at least one at the feeders behind the store here, at least one a, a year. And it does look really, really strange. Um, sometimes they lose just the crest on the top of their head. Sometimes they'll move all the feathers at once. So they almost look like a tiny little vulture. Um, although it looks weird, it's perfectly normal. And those feathers will grow back within two or three weeks or so. You should start seeing them grow back. That being said, sometimes they can have mites and things like that that cause the feathers to, to come off. But most likely it is a juvenile that's doing its first molt and it's molting them all at once so it does look kind of weird um so i don't blame me <laughs> blame me for for being creeped out by it um josh cat is on and says hello a dog named boo uh gave an answer to steel monkey who said it is normal for blue jays to go through a seasonal molting in late summer nothing to worry about completely right uh let's see randy is on says good morning good morning randy vicky is on and says yesterday heard orchards hosted a butterfly themed luncheon complete with pollinator education life cycles and migration habits lunch concluded with guests launching recently hatched monarchs one farm working with naturalists to help the monarch populations it was a magical day kudos to herd orchards and their affiliates ah, that's great to know um yeah herd orchard is a great great place to go and that's good to hear that they are doing things for pollinators that's wonderful um steel monkey says thanks sharon is on and says some of my invasive groups are really against the butterfly bush i've never had one i've never had one uh probably multiply yeah i think as as you go further south they can multiply and get a lot larger and overtake gardens i've never had one overtake my garden i've got a couple small ones that are um, popping up in my garden that have just been there and they, they're not really growing really huge but yeah they can get invasive so they're not a native plant so they they can um, people can have kind of different thoughts about them but they do provide a lot of nectar so there is that too just like lantana up here in the north it doesn't really become invasive and spread but down south like in florida it can really really grow and and spread um so yeah some people are against the butterfly bush because it, it can overtake other things but here not so much you can always chop it down too if it's getting too too big you can chop it down um almost down to the roots and it'll um, it'll grow back especially if it's starting to get big and kind of like woody if it's getting woody plant stems you can tr uh, trim it down to kind of keep it in line um jen is on and she says gross beaks have left orioles are still in abundance at our feeders still only seeing one hummingbird and of course all the daily regulars so it sounds like her gross beaks are are gone for the season it's about that time of the year where things are starting to go um the orioles will be around to, through the end of the month usually people still see them same with hummingbirds um usually labor day is about when they start to, to leave that being said people will still see hummingbirds through uh some of september so that's not totally 
uncommon to see them through the month of September. So she still has some Orioles and a hummingbird, but it, oh, the uh, gross beaks have left. Um, Ed is on. It says, great show again, Liz. I'm going to forward the link to our niece's son who will most likely be as fascinated as I was. Oh, that's great. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, Jen says, oh, second brood of bluebirds have fledged two days ago. All right. So Jen has some bluebirds that are fledging. That's good to know. Second brood. Um, they might have a third. We're getting a little late in the season, but they might. They can have up to three broods a year. And Patty is on. She's just seeing Orioles and hummingbirds at the feeder. So Patty is still seeing some of those migrants that are coming in. We um, did a birding cruise on Thursday here with the store and um, we went on the Genesee River and we saw a ton of great egret which you can find in the fall they tend to be here uh, more so in the fall than in the spring during migration we saw great blue heron we saw green heron and uh, we saw some shorebirds too we're in shorebird migration right now so we saw some shorebirds we saw an osprey but there weren't that many red-winged blackbirds. They seem to have left. There was just a couple. We saw maybe two or three red-winged blackbirds, even though we were right on the river with all the, the cattails. Um, not many red-winged blackbirds left. So things are starting to go down south. Uh, Vicki also says a pair of hummingbirds are enjoying feeders and flowers this week. So Vicki is also getting some hummingbirds. Um, she says yellowtails and monarchs too. So she's getting tiger swallowtails and some monarch butterflies. So yeah, we'll be having monarch butterflies in the area for about another month or so with the peak being early to mid September. So definitely still of them around, still lots of them around. And uh, so keep your eye out in your garden. Looks like that's everybody's comments and questions for the day. Thank you guys for tuning in. And we'll be back on Tuesday with another live broadcast. So until then, have a great weekend and we will talk to you soon. Bye-bye.